Good afternoon, and um, thank you all so much for coming. My name is Jim McCleskey. I am a faculty member in the Mechanical and Nuclear Engineering Department here at VCU, and I have the privilege of working with the Faculty Development Committee in the School of Engineering. So before I introduce our guest, I just want to thank the members of that committee, uh, Diane Pollock, Chris Lemon, uh, Vamsi Yadavali, Thomas Arads, and Umit Uzger, Uzger um, for helping with the planning and getting everything ready. So thanks to them. I also want to thank the, the folks in the dean's office who actually do the work. So Jenny Lee Shanks and Hannah uh, Navarrete and Tony Harris, who's still running around doing things. Um, without them, it wouldn't have happened. And, and Cheryl and her folks from the communications department for all the publicity and getting everybody here. And thank you all for coming. This is the inaugural seminar of the School of Engineering seminar series, and so I think we've got a great one for us today, and I hope you all will agree with me, and then we'll have many more to come. I do need to thank two more people. I need to thank Peru Jenna. Uh, Peru was kind enough to make the connection with Dr. Dresselhaus, and so thank you, Peru, for helping set this up. And then we need to thank Dean Boyan and Dean Coleman for helping to uh, provide the support. So now, without further ado, let me do the introductions. Professor Mildred Millie Dresselhaus is an institute professor at MIT in the departments of electrical engineering and physics. She's a member of, get your pencils out, National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering. She served as the director of the US Department of Energy Office of Science, president of the American Physical Society, treasurer of the National Academy of Sciences, president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, Chair of the U.S. National Ac Academy Decadal Study of Condensed Matter and Material Physics, and on many advisory committees and councils. Uh, she told me just last couple weeks ago she was in D.C. on another meeting. She's received numerous awards, including the U.S. National Medal of Science, the Fermi Award, the Kavli Prize, and at least 31 honorary doctorates worldwide. She's the co-author of eight books and about 1,700 papers on carbon science and as she is particularly well known for her work on carbon nanomaterials and other nanostructural systems. Her research over the years has covered a wide range of problems in condensed matter and materials physics, and I think you'll hear some of the highlights of that today. Dr. Dresselhaus is also a leader, uh, both in word and deed, in promoting opportunities for women in science and engineering. She received a Carnegie Foundation grant in 1973 to encourage women's study of traditionally male-dominated fields, including physics. And in 1973, she was appointed to the Abby Rockefeller Moss Chair, an institute-wide chair endowed in support of scholarship of women in science and engineering. This afternoon, Dr. Dresselhaus's talk is entitled, My 50-Year Adventure with Nanoscience, and she will focus on how her early career started, how setbacks led to discoveries, looking towards the future, and then some take-home messages before we have the Q&A. Um, she has an amazing personal story, and I hope you'll hear a little bit of that today. And so without further ado, oh, one more thing. Afterwards, there's a reception in engineering, so uh, come down to East Hall to the Kimande Auditorium and shake her hand and eat a cupcake. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Mildred Destelhaus. Thank you very much for inviting me and giving me uh, the opportunity and honor of starting a, a lecture a series uh, that is designed to interest people that uh, maybe have less uh, background than the average uh, and give them inspiration that they can make it to. Because I didn't know I was supposed to talk about this. But myself, and I think that uh, Professor Jena is another uh, member in this category. Uh, when we were young, nobody would ever imagine we would be doing what we're doing today. So uh, everything is possible, and just put your mind to it, and you will succeed. So that, that's the, uh, the gist of my talk, and I'm, uh, there'll be some question and answers if you uh, like. So, uh, but my talk is mostly about the science, and I'll uh, weave in some personal anecdotes because I didn't know I was supposed to, so, but now I do, so. <laughs> so, 
uh, my first view graph is really very appropriate. Uh, this is me struggling in the lab uh, in my early career. That's a picture of me as a postdoc. And I did a postdoc quite independently. I did have um, a fellowship from the NSF, which supported me, but nobody at the university, this is Cornell University, thought that there was a possibility of a career for, in science for me. So I was very much ignored, and I just did my own thing. And, but it all worked out in the end, as I'm going to tell you. So this is me recently, and I'm still at it. Um, so I'm now in my almost mid-80s, 84th birthday coming up in a few weeks. And I, I'm still enjoying every day. I'm in the lab right, right and early in the morning. And I have students and postdocs and collaborators and having joy of my life. So I wish it on all of you. So what is nanoscience anyway? And nanoscience is about the science of small things on the nanoscale. So what's nanoscale? The top of this scale is one centimeter. And one centimeter is sort of like this. Uh, you can see it very easily. It's um, uh, 2.5 centimeters is an inch, if you like the American metric, metric, which is not a metric system, but it's, it's, a, it's a metric anyway. Uh, and what happens is we go up in numbers. We can go 27 more orders of magnitude uh, to make the end of the universe, which is as far as uh, any um, investigation from the astronomy community has gone. So there are many um, more orders of magnitude in getting bigger. Uh, and getting smaller, when we go, go smaller from one centimeter, um, and we get, as you can see here, I don't have a laser pointer, but you can see um, uh, there one micron. So we go six orders of magnitude down, uh, and we get uh, to a micron from the, the meter. And now to get from a micrometer, then down to the scale of um, one angstrom, we have three more orders of magnitude. And the nanoscale is in that red circle that I've just mentioned. So what happens? So uh, most of the limits, say, from the fraction of light and all that sort of thing is at the top of that scale. And at the bottom of the scale is the size of uh, the distance between atoms, like uh, smallest distance, uh, say, two carbon atoms, which is very small atom in nature, is, is two, two and a half um, uh, angstrom. So, uh, so th this covers uh, a kind of a microscopic range. And um, you could see DNA somewhere on this uh, chart. From here, it's a little hard for me to find the DNA. But it, 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 DNA is, is two and a half uh, 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 angstroms. Not nanometers, but angstroms. So, uh, and this whole uh, uh, circle is where I've made my almost all of my career. And it's a real fun place to be, and that's where nanoscience is. And I hope that some of the contagion uh, I hear of this uh, uh, infirmity and will be caught up by all of you, then you'll be interested in the nanoscale too, because there's a lot of action and interest there. So what is it about? So uh, for me, in being a, a materials physicist, it's about exploration of what happens in that red circle, what new science comes about. And uh, so we have electricity that flows in that, that scale, and we can actually measure it. The carriers of charge are electrons and holes, to the absence of electrons. And um, the atoms in that scale vibrate, and the vibrations occur 
uh, on that scale. And, and the vibrations are, are carriers of thermal energy. So they establish the temperature that we, we know it was the hot or cold that, ha that happens at that, that scale. And uh, the electrons and phonons actually scatter each other. So as they're conducting heat or charge or whatever, um, they disturb each other. And that disturbance gives us information about each of the carriers. So we like to measure all of those things. And a probe that we use are the photons, and that's the bottom of this uh, uh, chart. And they're the carriers of light electromagnetic energy. So those are the main things that are tools. And then we have to have machines to operate these tools, and that's what people have been studying <coughs> for the past uh, years. Um, so I was trying to give you some motivation why we're interested in this length scale. And um, it was recognized now for some years that the nanostructured materials are important because the behavior in that uh, uh, size scale uh, is different than the behavior is in the classical world, and the behavior of uh, either carrying electricity or carrying thermal energy or whatever um, is governed by principles of quantum mechanics rather than classical mechanics, which is at larger length scales. Of course, I, astronomy is another story, and I, I'm not speaking about that. Maybe when you get to the, uh, the length scales that are well above the chart that I showed for, on the nano world, um, our new things happen, and we have galaxies created and destroyed and collisions between them, and that's not covered in my talk. Maybe you'll have another visitor sometime that covers that size, that, that's an important uh, topic nowadays, because we have new tools for that as well as on the nanoscale. But getting back to my own assignment here, uh, the reason uh, we have um, uh, importance in the nanostructured world is because it's governed by quantum mechanics. In, in the uh, uh, systems of this size, the surface becomes important, otherwise the surface only involves very few of the atoms in the whole system, but when you get to the nanoscale, there becomes a significant number, so surfaces are important. And because surfaces are important, it, this thing has to do with catalytic activity, which has to do with surface reactions. And so chemistry is very much um, uh, uh, dependent on understanding this um, uh, size range. And um, what uh, we are interested in here as well is how to control the activity uh, at this size scale so we can get information about the interactions of electrons, phonons, carriers of heat, and uh, electromagnetic um, interactions. So let's keep postponing that till we're finished. All right, so th that's the um, uh, story. When uh, I got the invitation from uh, Puru Jena uh, to come here, I said, well, my talk probably should be something uh, beyond what I do of nanoscience, but how all of this fits into the bigger picture of what happens in my field, which is materials research. And it's his field also. He does theory, and I'm more involved with the experiment. So um, I was in charge of a study by the National Academy of um, Engineering Science and Institute of Medicine, the whole complex in Washington. Um, and uh, our charge was to predict um, before uh, 2010 what would happen in the period between 2010 and 2020. So that's the decade we're in now, but we wrote this and the the report came out two years before. So this is prognosticating about the future. And so we um, made some predictions um, about the future. And it's always interesting to make predictions about the future. And uh, what always comes out of this 
is that, that the predictions are always wrong because what actually happens is very, very different because this science moves, so, moves forward so quickly that we can't really figure out what's going to come in the future. We figure out a few things and so that there's some uh, merit to this report and I, I would say that the, the, the biggest merit of the report is it, it, it became a, a framework for other studies that followed. So there were about 10 other studies of what's going to happen in, in uh, period 2010 to 2020 and different things about science, not, not about what's happening in the field of materials and, uh, and physics related to it, but every, many other things. And, and I, I imagine there are many other things that could be uh, uh, said uh, in prognosticating the future. And I suppose all of them are about as um, uh, off base as this one. But uh, I'll focus on the part that, that's probably not so off base. So uh, uh, the challenges that we came up with is that um, we'll be studying in this decade, and we are studying, the interaction between all these fundamental particles like uh, electrons and phonons and light. and yeah, That's a big part. If you pick up the journals, that's a big part. And um, what is the physics of life? There, is, uh, there are physical principles that govern life, creation, the end uh, of life. And so we can study that. And that hasn't been studied before very much. And that's a growing field. I don't know if there's much activity in that field here. I think we gave it maybe more emphasis than, than it, it has actually materialized in the last half of this decade. But uh, it could be that this is going to take off more in the second half. Who knows? And uh, the next thing, for, uh, uh, events happening far from equilibrium and why they occur, um, that is uh, still under study. That's, that was a pretty good uh, topic that we prognosticated. Um, uh, how to meet the energy demands of the future. I think that this is uh, uh, obviously going to be a, a big uh, topic before us. And the reasons for, for this is that the population of the world is increasing and uh, uh, the energy resources uh, as they're being found uh, are not increasing in the same rate. And, uh, but the interesting thing is that every report that's ever been written on this subject uh, seems to indicate that we're, we're going to, uh, um, uh, population will increase quicker than our energy supply. But uh, we are so, so have been so clever in the in last uh, 20, 30 years since these uh, studies started uh, that um, uh, we discover new, new sources of energy, new ways to, to make it available uh, all the time. Uh, and so uh, the prognostication is not as dire as, uh, uh, no, the reality is not as dire as the prognostic, uh, prognosis. Uh, so anyway, for all you young people in the audience, this is a good field to work on and to keep that, that good record to stay ahead of the, uh, uh, of the game and supply enough energy to keep uh, people uh, with the, set, the kind of standard of living that they've gotten used to. Um, information technology uh, 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 was, seemed to be uh, coming to an end at the end of the, we couldn't think of going smaller, smaller, and, and, and increasing uh, the efficiency of all forms of, of creating and utilizing energy, but we did. So uh, uh, we make all kind of predictions, but then we don't count on all the new discoveries of science that we never thought about. New techniques, new um, sources, new ways of um, uh, increasing efficiency, and all of this has happened. Just think of how lighting is today and how it used to be. The LEDs are taking over and they have so much more um, efficiency 
And we, ten years ago, they were hard, we, they were discovered, of course, but we hadn't utilized them so much. So um, as science moves forward, and uh, it's up to people in the audience to keep that uh, march forward um, uh, going, and uh, it's it's every decade, um, new new students, new uh, graduate students come along, and there are projects for you to keep all of this. Uh, uh, all these aspects of civilization moving forward um, uh, with the uh, contributions made of science. So, uh, and what uh, new discoveries await us in the nano world, and that's what I'm mostly going to talk about. But a few things, so I have pictures here, examples of hap what happens far from equilibrium. So this is part of, uh, of existence. It ha the, the top picture, uh, upper right, on your s for you, uh, shows uh, uh, fish swarming around. And you would think that if you look in the ocean, you'd find the fish distribution to be n uniform and it's a small uh, space, but it's not. They, they cluster. And, um, and so that, that's one example of, of, of equal. They're out of equilibrium always. They're moving. and and this distribution is changing, but the average distribution is about similar. Um, uh, uh, a galaxy is something out of uh, equilibrium, uh, and every year we discover more of these we, as we penetrate further into the in distance. It's hard to imagine how we're going to go beyond where we are now, but I'm sure in 10 years we will have succeeded, but I don't know how. So. Uh, th these are challenges for you. Um, so uh, out of equilibrium has some bad aspects. So you see on, on, on your left the breakup of an airplane. Okay, that's not so good, especially if you're on it. But uh, uh, on the right, you see the use of out, out of equilibrium to make uh, uh, wonderful new materials, and that's something that we like to see more and more of. So. Uh, um, Principles of science can be used for good and bad. That's uh, the message here. Uh, information technology is, uh, has made a, a huge impact on science and education. Uh, we're just at the beginning of most of this, and uh, especially on the education side. And we were talking about this uh, earlier today with some faculty and students in my trip here. And, uh, but, uh, there's a huge amount to be said about this topic, and this is under serious discussion uh, worldwide, and we don't have any real good idea of where we might end up. So um, we've had different uh, uh, revolutions in the education system, and we're undergoing one right now. What's the role of the student? What's the role of the professor? What's the role of textbooks? what's the role of, uh, of the new technology. And we don't really know what that is, so this is a challenge. And um, so here are uh, new materials, and so you, one way to think about it is simplest way is to take material A and B and combine them, you make material C. The material C can be made in different combinations of A and B. So you have a large world, uh, of possibilities, and uh, that gives you much ex exploration. So we're still with that, and um, um, I, I think that that will be in probably in your lifetime, combining A and B to make C. But then we'll have different things. Of, uh, there are different ways to make new materials that we haven't even dreamt about, so that's for the future. Uh, nature does this, and here you see the DNA. That's on uh, two and a half um, uh, uh, angstroms is uh, diameter of DNA, double helix. And uh, built on that, you have uh, the flowers um, and um, all the things that biology has produced by evolution and other means. Um, uh, on the left, we see what, what uh, electronics does. This is the physical world. And uh, well, we're, we're, we don't know how to make this yet, anything of that scale. That, that's really uh, too productive, but we're getting, getting there. 
getting there. And probably in the next decade, we will be much closer to being on this scale with, um, well, we, on a given ship, you can have entire circuits now. And so they're just, uh, when this, this was written fi five years ago, uh, roughly this, this report, um, that's the way the circuits look. They look different now, so just in five years. So that's an interesting. <coughs> uh, this uh, view graph is to show that, that the world isn't uh, uniform in its appreciation of science and technology. And this is just a measurement uh, of the light uh, emitted when you're out there in space. And you can see there are parts of the world. You can see Japan up on the right, and you can see uh, North America on the, on the left, and Europe. Uh, they're very lit up, and there's a lot of activity in the nano world in those countries. But then you have some continents. Uh, uh, Africa doesn't have a whole lot. Uh, then that's a population that's maybe the most populous uh, uh, of, of the continents. South America doesn't have, it has a few spots that are blooming here. And uh, those are really moving forward very, very quickly and becoming very active in the, in the world scene of science. But we don't, the rest of the, uh, of the continent is, is not so active. So um, here are some ideas of uh, uh, topics, if you look at the report, of uh, topics that might be interesting for, for uh, meeting the energy challenge. And most of those are turned out to be active, uh, indeed. And, and uh, big progress has made just in five years, as predicted. But there may be some other uh, areas uh, in the new materials area that uh, I'll end up my talk that we're just starting to do now that we uh, maybe knew about them for a long time, but nobody pursued them with interest. And they're uh, all of a sudden emerging to be uh, a very exciting. So every two, three years, at least in my field, something new pops up that, that sort of attracts everybody's attention. And then armies of people move in, you know, thousands of people. All of a sudden, we go from zero publications to a thousand in one year. And it's a kind of an amazing effect because we have now trained people in all of these different areas, and they can all pounce up into these uh, um, fields. So. Um, you can see a catalysis, uh, fuel cells, um, hydrogen, all kind of topics uh, on this list. Um, so you can go for it. Well, now, now I'll get to myself, because I was supposed to say something about myself, and I didn't know that when I put the talk together. I didn't find that out until I arrived here. So um, I'm, I'm going to tell my story starting in 1960. So. 50, almost 55 years I, I have on this uh, view graph. So um, when I started my independent career, that was 1960, so a long time ago, and uh, I was told that I could work on anything except something I knew something about. So uh, and at the time, it was a <coughs> daunting um, uh, advice and, and requirement even. Uh, and uh, but uh, I took it seriously, and I think it was the very best thing I did in my life. So, um, and I was told today that I should uh, focus on some of uh, uh, the big challenges that I had. Uh, actually, my biggest challenge happened long before I started college, growing up in a disadvantaged neighborhood. Well, I did, I, when I grew up, I didn't know anybody that had gone to college except for the, stu the, the school teachers that I had in elementary school. So, uh, and there were other people in the audience that grew up under similar circumstances, and they're here. So uh, going through that very first step of uh, from coming from nowhere to somewhere is, uh, is hard because you don't know where you're going, and you have to find somebody that helps guide the way so you don't get too much lost in the forest. So 
uh, anyway, I, I uh, finished my PhD in, in 1958, uh, one year after Sputnik, and it was a great time to finish PhD because uh, the U.S. was behind. So when the U.S. is behind, somebody puts some money so that from in Washington, it's not very far from here, so you know about this. And you know some of the great leaders, uh, Thomas Jefferson came from around here somewhere. And um, so he was a visionary and you had other visionaries. Uh, uh, and they believed in science, which was good. And even our present president believes in science and he would like to put more money in, and I've heard it from him himself. I was in the Oval Office a couple of times this year and spoke with him. So, uh, and that, of course, you would never have thought that that would happen to me when I went at the beginning of this chart. So, uh, all things are possible. That's the message. Okay, so I, I, I started in carbon science because I thought the topic was interesting, and, uh, and I, I was willing to put time into it and effort. Uh, but I also, as I was telling students in the interviews that we had today, uh, always have a bread and butter, butter topic in case it fails, because my boss told me that this was going to fail. He said that people have been trying to study this material for some time, and uh, they haven't made a whole lot of progress. So uh, uh, maybe you shouldn't put all your effort into, it, into this. So I didn't, but I pursued it and that my judgment of interest uh, was correct. Uh, now, if it wasn't correct, you know, I've tried other things, they haven't all worked out, but it's amazing how many things have worked out because I've been lucky. And maybe when you have, once you, you do something and it works out, it helps you do the next thing to make that work out. I think maybe there's a correlation. So uh, uh, most of the, the things I'm gonna tell you about today are things I was told not to do uh, and discouraged, uh, but I tried them anyhow. Um, First, it starts out as a side project, and then it takes over because it's sort of like a disease, you know? It gets so interesting. I get everybody else around me interested, too, so we, we work on it. So, in the 1960s, I was studying just carbon, graphite, electronic structure, everything else structure, and, uh, and properties. And um, in the 1970s, uh, somehow, I gave a talk, as I'm going to tell you, uh, that changed my direction. Somebody asked me a question. And so asking questions at seminars or wherever in the classroom is a good thing because you, you can derail your professor, your colleagues, and give them ideas, and then they take off. Um, maybe they fail, but some of them maybe will succeed and change uh, what other people are doing. So um, then I worked on another topic, graphite intercalations. Now, fullerenes was uh, started by somebody else, and, um, and I joined in, in, in that venture because I was teaching a course in group theory, and when, I, um, when the fullerenes came around, I said, that's a wonderful homework problem. So I started with a homework problem, and then that took off and, and became a book. So a homework problem becomes a book. And, uh, and we had all kind of theses that, that came out of that. And um, so uh, in the middle of that, I'm gonna tell you how I got into nanotubes. And nanotubes also came from a question, and, uh, and that, that field really prospered. And uh, at the time, um, I had international collaboration help that one because I had some visitors, and I had the idea of, suppose we could make a nanotube, would that be interesting? So, but I didn't want to give a, 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 a topic to a student to work on if it wouldn't be interesting. Waste, they wa would waste their time, so we studied whether it would be interesting, and that turned out, I'll tell you that that turned out to be uh, a really great way to go about science. Suppose you can make it, is it interesting? 
Okay, and then, um, well, we started out with graphene actually in 1960, but we never thought we could make it, so it was just a Gedanken experiment, you know, in your mind, but as a guiding symbol in the beacon. But uh, then we joined the forces with all the other guys working on that in 2005 or something like that, just after the Novoselov Gaim paper came in. They knew how to make it, so we could make it too. And so we took off with that. And now we're in different things. We're going beyond graphene. So that's, that's the present. I'll tell you about that at the very end. Okay, so that's my 50 years in, in ca encapsulated. And uh, now a little bit about the details. So I have a, a, a one view graph per decade. So this is. Uh, so when I got my, I told you when I started my independent career, I, I decided that I was going to study uh, uh, graphite, carbon systems, and that was, because we didn't know the basis, the fundamentals, so I had to start with that. And um, uh, what I was very lucky in, in er, early on with this, that uh, I had a student and I had a colleague, and I put them all together. And uh, so the colleague was Ali Javan, who was the, the inventor of the CW laser. And the experiment that we had in mind that um, turned out to um, have big impact on science was the use of right and left circularly polarized light with a laser so we could focus a beam with those two kinds of light. That was the first experiment that had been done in magnetic fields with, with laser, with polarized light. And that allows us to uh, look at these uh, quantum levels of energy in a of an electron in a magnetic field running in a, a carbon system. That time we, it was graphite because we didn't have graphene. We didn't know how to make it. And what that did, the upshot of the uh, bottom line of this work, was it found out, identified where the electrons were sitting in momentum space and where the holes were. And it was backwards from what was known before. And so that sort of uh, launched uh, quantitative studies of carbon systems without that if you have the wrong identification of electrons and holes, you don't make very much progress. So uh, that was a kind of um, a example of how advances in technology, that was, I, sa I said, the first magnetic field uh, study with, with lasers that was done with polarized light. Um, and that was the outcome. And from that, we mapped out, as you can see on the left, that's details only for the aficionados, the, uh, the differences. You could see that the valence and conduction bands look different, so that means that the holes and electrons have different properties. You could just see that the lines look different. That's sufficient for um, uh, just general audience uh, to understand what the impact of that work was. So. Um, I was pretty young at that time, so this is my first foray into um, the new, the new uh, the science. And on the basis of, of this work, pretty much, um, and what was leading up to it, I, I became a professor. So it, before that time, I was a research staff person, and I didn't really think I'd ever be anything different than that, even though I. I, when I went to college, I went to college to become a school teacher, and I got converted while I was um, uh, an undergraduate my second year to uh, a science major rather than uh, just being a school teacher by uh, Rosalind Yellow, who was my teacher. It was the one only course she ever taught in physics. And she taught this course because she couldn't get a job and she needed to have some kind of livelihood. And so she found a job in Hunter College, which was mostly for t uh, developing school teachers like myself. And we met and became lifelong friends and interacted for 
my career uh, uh, for many years until she passed on. So uh, that's an important uh, uh, thing to, to comment in the context of this lecture series is the influence that what gets you and changes your, your career path. And uh, I, we had a good influence on each other because after uh, that teaching that course, she actually did get a job and her job led to uh, the uh, discovery of radio immunoassay that she got the Nobel Prize for in 1977. It wasn't that many years after she taught me, maybe 20 years, which is not, not such a long time in going from nothing because she had no background in any of the things that she was doing at that time. But she couldn't get a job, so she found a job in medical in a hospital and of the Veterans Hospital in the Bronx. That was not a place you would expect a Nobel Prize winner to be trained and, and grow up, but, but when you can't get a job, you're happy to get what you can, can get. So, so I thought that was a public interest story for you, is uh, you can start any place and get anywhere. It just depends on you and, and what you make out of uh, failures and problems in life. So, okay, um, uh, I'm interested in studying carbon systems. Carbon systems are layered. I would like to study single layers, but we didn't know how to make them. But we, somebody came and told me uh, when I was giving a talk at Bell Labs. Bell Labs was the mecca of physics at, in, the, in the 1960s, and they, on the basis of the work we did with uh, I, that I told you on graphite, they invited me as a very young scientist to give a, a big lecture at Bell Labs. And um, at that time, I got a, a, a question from somebody in the, off, uh, in the audience, Bruce Hene. You probably haven't heard of him, but he was one of the group leaders at Bell Labs. And he asked me a question about uh, wouldn't it be interesting to put something between the layers to separate them more. And if by separating them more in different ways, you maybe could learn something new about uh, the host material, which is these carbon layers that you see here, the hexagon. So that was a great idea, and we pursued it. So that uh, giving talks and getting uh, questions that are hard, good, even if it challenges you and you can't answer everything about it on the spot, Maybe it has an impact on you and uh, on science. So this is an example of one of those things. So we started working on, on intercalation compounds, and uh, that became a sort of our main topic for about 15 years. And then high TC superconductivity came along, so we had a little sojourn on that, but I don't include that in my talk today, because lots, so many other people did that and did more things. But, so I just stick today uh, the things that uh, we did that had uh, a significant impact. So uh, this sort of led to understanding intercalation compounds, and I've, I have a few books on the subject, and big review articles, and so I worked in this field for a long time, and uh, became known. It was in, during this time I became president of the American Physical Society, and all these things that were told in the introduction because people got to know about the work. So um, I was a very young person to be president of the American Physical Society because that was 30 years ago. And uh, I'm still here. So let's get rid of this. I don't have time to figure out what they want. Okay, so uh, move on. So now, now 1980s. So we're, we're in, how did I get into the fullerenes? So I knew, I knew Smalley, and we used to talk about possibility of making clusters and all this, because I was doing clusters and he was doing clusters of different things. And, um, uh, but for me, I was invited to Exxon. And uh, Exxon uh, showed me that they uh, could go. This is a plot here that you see. Um, uh, this is something hitting um, a carbon and making clusters. And how big can the clusters be? How, what is the mass of the clusters? And they had some spe uh, experts there, a mass spectroscopy. And they had gone to see up 
up as far as C15. And it turned out at the time that we were interested in going beyond C15. And I encouraged them. I said, you've been so good. You've gotten as far as C15. Suppose you hit this whole, these carbons harder and you make bigger clusters. Maybe you can make more than C15. And uh, so they did that. And the um, rest is history. And they got a spectrum that looked like this. So that spectrum was uh, published in 1984. And uh, that sp spectrum really excited me, uh, but it also excited Smalley, and he did the spectrum much better and identified that these peaks in the spectrum were important and that you notice that they're C60 and C70, and that explanation was the fullerene. So the people at Exxon observed the effect. They really did the experiment that won the Nobel Prize, but they didn't understand the experiment. So uh, they didn't understand the, pr the present day interpretation, shall we say. They understood what a spectroscopist maybe would say, but they didn't go beyond that and fantasize what it could mean. But Smalley did, and uh, so the rest, the rest is history. But what I got into um, was uh, doing all the symmetry for the different kind of uh, fullerenes you could make. So C60 is just one of many fullerenes. And uh, I was teaching a course in group theory when this paper was published. And I said, wow, this is a great topic for group theory course. So I took off on that. And uh, that gave me many ideas that, uh, and we had thesis projects that were done by a number of other people uh, that were in the course. And some of these people became well known. But uh, nothing continues like planned. And 1990, the Magnet Lab, where I had worked, that was my main base for 30 years doing high magnetic field research, disappeared and moved to Florida. And I didn't move to Florida with the Magnet Lab, so I changed fields. Career change. So I tried a lot of different things, and um, one of the things I tried was fast optics. And so I did experiments like this, um, um, hitting something like this uh, with a laser, you know, very big pulse, looking what came off, uh, because this is, was like the clusters I told you about. There's something related to that game. The idea was like that. And so I had a few students that did really interesting theses. But then I, I, I quit doing that um, uh, very soon thereafter. And I'll tell you what happened. So uh, I didn't think that we could be competitive. There were more people that were doing better work than we were. So recognize defeat. <laughs> and yeah, we learned about it. And we could use uh, fast optics and various things. But that wasn't where I was going to go after no more magnetic fields. That was not going to be my new home. So that was one defeat. But when you're defeated, you have to uh, work it into success. Don't be defeated forever. So just move on when you're, you're not competitive. And um, so I, I was still doing some other things. And just at the same time, so as you see this is December 1990s, the same time the Magnet Lab moved away, and I was uh, casting about what to do. Uh, I was invited, luckily, to talk about this book that you see on the upper right corner. And it's called Graphite Fibers and Filaments. So uh, I wrote this book with some collaborators. And I wrote it for the students because they couldn't understand carbon fibers and filaments, uh, which were produced and were just long, skinny rods, basically, that you could put leads on. And they turned out to be wonderful agents to study intercalation compounds. So we used them, and then we learned a lot about them. And uh, the government became very interested in graphite fibers and filaments. So they used to invite me for talks and, and whatnot. And I was invited to one of these talks. 
public discussion session in Washington. There were two invited speakers, myself, talking about this book, Carbon Fibers and Filaments, which is interesting for, interesting for the government for practical application. So sometimes some of the things we do are, become important to somebody else, even though we don't know about it. So that one became important. And they invited me. And they, Smalley uh, uh, had just discovered, written some papers on the fullerene C60, and he was also invited thinking that that was going to maybe would have some impact on government interests. So um, being a public servant uh, and volunteering your time uh, for uh, society is not a bad thing. So that was what I was into and that was what uh, Rick Smalley was into. And then what happened is they, we were the two invited speakers and they put us on the stage like this. We had two seats. And we had the question period. And uh, some guy, I don't know who it is, I wish I knew who, the, who asked the question because this changed my career. So he asked the question and changed Rick's career too. So it had a big impact on the two of us. So uh, he asked us, what's the connection between C60 and carbon fibers or graphene fibers, graphite fibers? And so, well, C60 goes elongated to C70 that was known already. So imagine you make C80 and C90, elongate. Eventually you get a tube, single wall nanotube. So, so we started talking about, well, suppose you could do this, and maybe interesting. So um, uh, that uh, fall, uh, I had two young people uh, coming to um, MIT to visit, so back to here. Uh, Saito and Fujita, and they were just starting their careers, just young faculty members, and they were, um, the Japanese government, when they give you a faculty position after a couple of years and you look promising, they send you off to someplace in the West to uh, learn something new. So these two guys, they didn't know each other, they showed up in my lab. They wanted to learn something new. So I said, you know, I went to this um, a conference, and so we talked about, suppose you stretch C60 out and get something long, uh, what would happen? And uh, so would it be interesting? So they both were interested in this, and they got to work independently on this, independently and together. You know, like that. They, what one was analytic and, and the other one was geometric. So they were really a good team, and so we uh, came up with this paper, making a prediction that um, the if you could make something like this, it would be a, a new thing that could either be uh, a semiconducting tube or a metallic tube, depending on some technicality that I'll explain. So you know that uh, uh, from what we, we know today, the Nobel Prize that, that went to graphene, that we have Dirac cones. Well, we knew Dirac cones from 1947. That's when Dirac cones came in for carbon systems. But it wasn't widely discussed. It wasn't a, a thing. It was just uh, something strange. And, and it was something that attracted me to carbon. So I was very much aware of this. And uh, so uh, we did this calculation together that we have, you have a one-dimensional system. I told you that properties of, of low-dimensional systems, like wires or, or little particles or something, uh, behave differently from um, uh, big things. So. Uh, so quantum mechanics is important. So here's the quantum mechanical density of states. And uh, so if you have a very small uh, cylinder, as you can see on the left, there's a cylinder. And the cylinder has a few atoms, 10 atoms. So 10 atoms means that you have 10 cutting lines, 10 quantum states. So, uh, so there are 10 states. And we can put this, that's uh, shown by this dark arrow. And that determines the spacing of these peaks in the density of states. That, that's a summary of what happens. People that know 
quantum mechanics know the details of this. If you don't know, uh, just this is the consequence. Uh, however, when you draw these um, cutting lines, if they should meet from the valence and conduction bands from the top uh, cone to the bottom cone, uh, then you would have a metallic state. Otherwise, you'd have a semiconducting state. So the physics of it is very easy to understand uh, if you know something about these density states. But for a physics person, that would be easy to understand. Uh, but when we published this paper, we actually managed to get this published. But uh, it created a lot of controversy. And we also had papers published after it saying it couldn't possibly be. And they had all kind of objections about uh, why it couldn't be. But it turned out that in 1998, six years later, um, it was shown experimentally to be correct. OK, uh, uh, okay I'll, I'll speed up. Uh, this, this part is interesting for a general audience, so I, I just uh, uh, I'll say some more about this. So uh, there are times when experts come up, so experts, the people understand that this, we've known about this uh, density of states for many, many years, but nobody predicted semiconducting and metallic tubes. I mean, that, that you can have the same system that depending on how the hexagons you see over there are oriented with respect to the axis could change the metallicity. That was a, a, a very new idea, and it wasn't believed to be correct until it was demonstrated in the laboratory. So laboratory demonstrations are very important. And when students come up with ideas that sound really strange, say, show me, because there were some consequences of something you could actually measure. And when it, as soon as it was measured and demonstrated, every, the controversy ended instantly. So it was, there were two papers that came, one from Europe and one from the US, came at the same time, the same issue back to back. It was very, very interesting how that happened. So now, now we know we can have metal and semiconducting um, uh, constituencies in something that just differs by the orientation of a nanostructure. That's a very interesting concept. And uh, so now that people take off with this, and we can do many more things. So uh, I'm, I have uh, just a little bit of time, so I'm going to run through many things here. So uh, um, from this, we did spectroscopy. And, and uh, spectroscopy demonstrated that we could make use of those very high densities of states. and. Um, so then I, at a, a seminar like this, somebody asked me a question. If you can really do this, do you think that you could see one single nanotube? I said, gee, that's a good idea. We'll try. And so that led to this experiment. And we got uh, somebody up the street from us at Harvard University who knew how to make very uh, 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 small density of nanotubes on a substrate. And so we collaborated on this experiment. And he, he made this, uh, one of his students made the sample for us. And then we did an uh, um, uh, experiment on this individual nanotube that's spread over here. Pick this one, pick that one. Some were metallic, some were semiconducting, and, and show. Spectrum is very, very different. So that proved it. OK. So, uh, now, I'm going to go through many view graphs very, very quickly, just giving you the highlights because my time is up. So uh, nanotubes uh, uh, came in very early 1990s, so that's 20-some years ago. Most fields in 10 years are uh, sort of uh, exhausted. But uh, nanotubes is not exhausted. It's still a very active field, and you pick up the journals. There are many new things every year on nanotubes. Uh, and maybe even for the next 10 years, there'll be many new things for nanotubes. So one thing that we work on are two uh, double wall nanotubes, triple wall nanotubes, and we can make individual ones and study interaction between them. And so I have a student that's defending his thesis in a couple of weeks uh, in Europe. A European student came to MIT, spent a year to learn about this, and went back. So we have international collaborations. That's very important now in science. So um, 
but this is one example. I was reading the end of his thesis this morning coming down here, so that makes it real to you. All right, so um, I, I told you about nanotubes, and then uh, graphene is, is actually old. Uh, it started in 1961 is the first paper, as you see here, and um, by this fellow uh, Hans-Peter Böhm in Germany, and um, he demonstrated and um, wrote a paper on an individual nanotube, but nobody paid any attention to it for years and years. So. Uh, including himself. He didn't follow up on this very much. He just a few papers and then it, it died. But the graphene has been growing and it's an amazing material. You hear a great deal about it. There's a billion dollar program in Europe uh, and the U.S. is doing a lot in it and Asia is doing a lot. So um, many, many things because of its unique properties and industries are popping up and companies and whatnot. So uh, the spectrum is amazing in, in that. So for the aficionados, you, on the right you see the second order spectrum, on the left you see the first order spectrum. Quantum mechanics tells us the second order spectrum should be much weaker because it's just perturbation theory. How come? Well, it has to do with this linear uh, E versus K. So we have resonance for every single quantum number. So we have an unusual situation, so new physics is possible, and that's new physics is enabled by this wonder material graphene. It's also good for applications. I won't say much about that. So the sorts of things that we work on today with, with the, with, with the um, graphene is something different than other people. What happens as the layer number increases, which modes uh, which kinds of vibrations, which properties are maintained, which change with. And uh, you, you can see that over here that there's between 1500, where we have very big peak, that's first order effect, and second order effect, which is bigger, should be smaller, of course, by perturbation theory, but it isn't, that there are many little guys in there, and that's combination modes. And that's very interesting from group theory point of view, so we've been studying those things. Um, so th there are many, many more things that, that come about, so you spectrum initially and then you refine it and you get lots more things. Another thing that we've been studying are ribbons, um, and this kind of thing came about, this is a public interest, um, well, uh, I had a female student that came to work with me for a year on, on this topic. Uh, she was from Japan. and. She was the first graduate student they had at this university, female graduate student they had at this university. And uh, so she was having a hard time, and her professor thought she would be better off in the U.S. for a little while to see that women could make it too. So she came, and we did this paper that's very heavily cited, and this is studying the effect of the edges of ribbons. So ribbons, you see, have just few uh, atomic uh, unit cells, and the properties are very different. And what we showed in her thesis is that if, if the edges are the zigzag, and the zigzag edges are uh, the ones that are shown on the top, and the armchair edges are the ones shown on the bottom, you can see the edges look different. And you could see maybe the reason for the, for the uh, uh, nomenclature that we gave it, the names we gave it. But the physical properties are very different. The, the zigzag edge ha have these very high density of states at the Fermi level, as you could see here. And uh, uh, because of this, they can be distinguished uh, without touching the, the ribbon at all. You can just do it optically. So that's what we showed. And, uh, uh, the rest is kind of history. A lot of people have been working on them and studying all kind of other properties on the edges. So this is a new field of nanoscience that's come about. You know, n not only can have graphene edges, but any layered compound has edges, and the edges are interesting. So uh, that's an area that we have been studying. This is an example of, of Raman spectra, but there could be other things. And, uh, doing um, multiple different um, experiments in the same instrument. This shows you in a inside a microscope doing a transport measurement. 
so we can watch the transport happening in real time. So this is a new a direction of science, a very interesting, a lot, lot of things to do. And um, this is the effect what happens if you put a, a current flowing. You can get very high temperatures, like 2,000 degrees centigrade. And at, at that point, the atoms start moving around. And you can get alignments, like I'm going to show you here. So this is done in a very simple electron microscope. We can make something that looks like this. It uh, looks like a very expensive kind of um, uh, new material, but that's just carbon that's uh, been exposed to um, a thermal, uh, high thermal energy. And we can make nanotubes uh, merge. So here's an example. This is another thing you can do with this kind of. What we're working on now are beyond graphene, and so some of the examples uh, on the left is MOS2. That's a transition metal dichalcogenide and, uh, that I was studying with the people in, in Israel. They invited me back in 1990. We have some papers on this topic in bulk. But now we can make single layers, and they have very interesting properties. And if you pick up the literature, there are 1,000 papers now per year on these topics. Bismuth telluride in the middle is thermoelectrics. That's another research field in my group that we've been working on. Inspired by the U.S. government, they needed to have uh, um, uh, some way of thermoelectricity for going for their submarines to be able to navigate and not be detected. So got into that. Phosphorine is on the right. Uh, that's a new material for this year, just started. Um, it, the first conference on phosphorine was uh, uh, in May of this year, I believe. And uh, there were 50 people there. I think there's maybe a 1,000 papers now. <laughs> Very large. It just exploded. Uh, and you can see that the structure is layered, but it's sort of a layered with thickness. And it, uh, it has very different properties from graphene. This is column five in the periodic table. And, and carbon is column four of the periodic table. So this shows that we have now a whole new world opening up. Uh, and uh, when I did my thesis work, my next door neighbor was studying in, in uh, 1953, uh, wrote a, a, a significant important paper on this topic. But it wasn't followed up. That's, that's more than 50 years ago. So anyway, I'm, I'm saying that uh, things that we knew in the past, they pop up. And, uh, and so this is me recently for getting a prize. And some take home messages is that science is moving on. And uh, it's not over. Um, and I was told by Brian Pippard back in 1960, 1955, um, all the interesting things are done. There's nothing left for you. <laughs> Don't believe it. There's lots of things left for you, too, not only for me. I, I've had lots of things happening since that time. And what's important is to be excited about it, want to do it. and. Uh, it's not going to be an easy road. You're going to hit some stumbling blocks. I gave you a few of mine. You'll have your own. They'd be different. Uh, don't give up. And always have something on the side that you can say, oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm still making progress, even if the, the particular thing that you want, really want to do isn't working. So just keep going. And, um, and if, if you have a setback, think, think very carefully about how to recover, uh, because uh, some people quit at that point. They say, this isn't worth it. But uh, all the people that don't quit and stay, stay with it, when you ask them, they're very, very happy that they didn't quit when they were discouraged. So um, the important thing is to always keep finding topics uh, that interests you, even if the world it doesn't, isn't so interested in it. it might, if you think it's good, there's some chances that it might be good for other people, too. Uh, but keep something going so that you're appreciated anyway, and you're not thrown out from, from your 
uh, current work. So that, that's sort of my take home mes messages. I, I don't know if that was exactly what I was asked to do, but that's what I came up with. Thank you for listening to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I just um, want to thank you so much, Dr. Dresselhaus, for sharing this with us. And I'm looking for those students in the audience that are going to ask you the question that's going to get you triggered off for the next 10 years. Okay. <laughs> okay. Do I see? I, I'm, I've got one lurking in me. Okay. Well, my question's got to do with the carbon nanotubes. Well, because but should we try the students first? Yeah, let's see. I'm looking. <laughs> I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Uh, don't be shy. There's no dumb question. That doesn't exist. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I know what question. Go, go. Do you believe in nano nanotubes and crystals? Do you believe it could be possible to integrate nanotubes to eventually do uh, integrate detectors based on nanotubes? Oh, yeah. Well, there is uh, actually, um, there are big industries starting with nanotubes. Um, you Putting nanotubes on a, uh, on a substrate and having a sheet of nan a nanotube sheet, uh, kind of a uh, two-dimensional nano sheet, and uh, for displays, is a commercial thing now, and that that's going to be a big business. Uh, yes, the answer is yes. You know, uh, I don't know that anybody ever thought that that would be um, something useful for lithography, but. This is mass scale, huge business. Yeah, uh, there, there are many things that are happening uh, in the commercial world. The, the uh, uh, Europeans are betting on this. They put big money into uh, applications of uh, uh, carbon-based uh, systems. I'm, I know there are some people out here who've worked with graphitic carbon There's some graphenes in the audience. Of the layered compounds? <laughs> yeah. yeah. OK. Did we go shy? I, I, I'm looking for who that was. You. Oh, I have one. You have one. OK, ask it. Right in front of the light. I have a question. Uh, do you think it's highly possible to develop uh, some sort of bat hybridic process or uh, develop batteries that are more efficient to produce uh, to manufacture the graphene? Yes. Uh, in terms of like chicken fat. Yes. Do you think that's. Uh, it's already happening. But do you think it might be something that we will see commercially uh, within the next five years? I think it's already happening commercially. I, I think that Samsung is. Uh, the co combination, uh, you know that, that uh, carbon-based systems are used in batteries, right? Because you can intercalate, and that's the process that charge and discharge. So, uh, and uh, adding a graphene to nanotubes, making combinations of those, uh, is desirable. So, yes. Uh, there are many applications where you want to have the strength and you want to have the spreadability, and, and you want um, different things on. If you want to have just the same thing everywhere, you have just a graphene sheet. But if you want to have some uh, differences in different locations, then you use nanotubes on a graphene sheet. Because every nanotube is a little different from every other one, and so you get similarity but diversity at the same time. Yeah, think, think of applications that would benefit from that property and you're in business. I have a question. Like, uh, we know that classical computing benefits make uh, the future is for its own com quantum computing. So what is the future of graphene in the sector of quantum computing? Well, uh, it's hard for me to say exactly what, what the future is, um, but uh, people are investing and graphene exactly for carbon computing. That is one of the 
cited applications right now. I don't know exactly what they're doing with it. I haven't seen a product, but maybe somebody in the audience has seen a product. Uh, the, the product of, uh, of putting um, uh, nanotubes on a surface to, to make um, a network that you can address here, 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 here. Uh, uh, that, that's a commercial product now. I, I don't, you haven't seen it, but it's, it's being produced in China. I don't know that it's reached the markets here, but it's on the way. Next year, you'll have it it's like that. Okay, one last, yes, sir. What is the best fit to have to build that thing? Does it really take any time? What? The best technique to grow graphene. The best technique to, to grow graphene uh, uh, in large quantities is CVD, chemical vapor deposition. You can make huge amounts of it. And um, I think that's, that's the main commercial um, um, approach. Okay, you get one last chance. Yes. I'm, I'm gonna ask for not on the time, <laughs> well, um, my proudest achievement, uh, well, may, may, maybe the, the biggest impact was metallic and semiconducting nanotubes, I think was uh, probably the most interesting scientific one, probably. Yeah, doing, uh, um, discovering electrons and holes in, in, in graphite was exciting. And, you know, and, and interestingly, what those two, two discoveries had to do with is doubt by the community for, for a number of years that this experiment was correct because it was so unexpected to people. So the take-home message: sometimes the most um, the discoveries with most impact are discoveries that um, are not obvious. Even even after you publish it and it gets accepted by uh, the referees, mm -hmm. it's still not obvious to the community. And they try to disprove it, uh, and, and it could be wrong too. You know that that happens. Both ways. So uh, the scientific method and having people prove it in different ways is important. And it advances our understanding. Well, I want to thank you all. I have a special present for you. If you could bring it up. This is a modern technology that um, we in the School of Engineering have come to appreciate. You actually saw me using mine in the car today. Oh, so that I could- It's light. It's good. light, mm -hmm. it's little, but it's, it's, yes, it's in a, a BCU bag. It's old gold. This is the future. This is the future. This is the future. I have no idea what, the, oh. It's something that everybody needs that doesn't remember to charge their phone. Oh. Uh-huh. No, they get you in there. There's the cord. And there, it, another cord. You've gotta go in and get the device, the device. Okay. It's cute, it's little, and it says School of Engineering, so you'll oh. never forget us, oh. unless you forget to charge your phone. VCU. This VCU, School of Engineering. Now this plugs one end into there, one end into your phone, and you get charged in the car while you're driving Dr. Millie Dressel's house, and she never has to know how disorganized you were in not having a phone that could be used. 
Okay. That is. So I, I really want to thank oh. you very, very much for sharing yeah. this. You see, yeah. I know, it's perfect. Whoever invented that, I don't know, I'm putting them ahead of carbon nanotubes, I gotta tell you. This is a <laughs> great invention. Do you, so, do you think this is made of carbon nanotubes? There's some in there, I know there are some in there. <laughs> right. If it's a battery, it right. should have right. some. Yeah. At least. Well, thank you. Yeah. I hope all of you will come over to Engineering East Hall, which is on the other side of Belvedere. For those of you that never wandered that end of campus, you have to walk across that terrible street. And it's in the atrium. And we will be having a special thank you to Dr. Dresselhaus. Thank you. Thank you.